been talking about generosity, and, and we've been kind of making sure that we're not looking for one-time giving. How many of you understand that? We want to become generous people, and generous people in, on every level of our lives. We're not talking about just generosity in the sense of money, although we have seen that it does involve money, and it and involves really uh, that Jesus talks about money a lot. And so what we've been doing over the last several weeks is talking about that. Last week we talked about the test. How many of you remember the test? I don't think that's the question. I think the question is, are we passing the test? That's the real question. Uh, uh, and uh, so we talked about that, and over the, the next couple of weeks, we're going to finish our series. But today I want to talk to you about something that I believe is, is really important, because we are talking about both parts, both parts of stewardship. Somebody say stewardship. stewardship. Now, when you say any, what are you talking about both parts of stewardship? We kind of covered this in the beginning, meaning giving and managing. Say giving, giving. and managing. So let me just remind you, just so that you can remember this, we need a heart of love that is a motivation behind our generosity. All our generosity, no matter what it is, whether we're generous in our time, generous in our gifts, generous in our possessions, generous in our resources, the motive behind that is always a heart of love. And then we're talking about we need a mind filled with wisdom. Why? Because we need a mind filled with wisdom so that we know how to manage what God gives us. So on this Memorial Day weekend, as we are thankful for the sacrifice of those who were willing and did pay the ultimate price for others, I want you to turn with me uh, to the book of Matthew, and we're going to be looking in chapters 19 and 20, and that's where we're going to camp today. And in chapter 19, Matthew writes about Jesus in a very familiar passage. If you're around church, maybe you're not, maybe those of you that are tuned in, uh, if you've been around church, you've heard this story, you've probably read it yourself, but if you haven't, this is going to be not just new, but this is going to be kind of real refreshing. And Jesus meets up with this rich young man, and, or maybe some of you know him as the rich young ruler. That was really just for, for clarity. And he comes to Jesus, and he asks Jesus about what must he do, what good deed must he do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus responds by telling him, you must obey the commandments. How many of you remember that story? And so let me just give you the backdrop. So Jesus responds to him and says, you know, uh, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must honor your father and mother, and uh, you must love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if you look at the list that Jesus shares with with this young man, there's one that Jesus does not share, and we're going to see why, because Jesus didn't want to put him on the spot, but really he put himself on the spot. And then he says, and then he makes the statement, he says, yeah, Lord, but I've, I've obeyed all of these. Since I was a child. He says, I, I did this. I mean, I, I obeyed all of this. And then Jesus kind of hones in. And, and, and at first glance, Jesus addresses this rich young man. And he lays out a challenge or a, a crossroad before him. And the problem with this young man was the price that Jesus asked him to pay was a little bit too high. Uh, too high. How many of you know this? That people stop growing when the price gets too high. How many of you know that? That everybody wants greatness, everybody wants something, but, but not everybody's willing to pay the price for what they say they want. I really want this. Well, how bad do you want it? That's really the question. So this young man says, I really want eternal life. So Jesus, okay, how bad do you want it? Let me ask you to do something and watch this. And so the reason for that is the fact that he was blinded by what he temporarily possessed and he couldn't see past the present sacrifice to embrace a future reward. He couldn't let go of what he possessed to embrace what he truly needed. Now, let's pick this up in verse 20 and hang with me because we're going to kind of go through this line upon line and kind of draw some principles out of this today. Watch this. I've, be- I've obeyed all these commandments or commandments. The young man replied, what else must I do? Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, somebody say, if you want to be perfect, watch this now, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. How many of you know that is pretty profound? Okay, but watch the verse 27 or 22. Look at his response. But when the young man, what? Heard this, he went away sad, for he had what? Many possessions. This young man had a desire to obey God, but when Jesus laid out the price, he was unwilling to pay it. By being unwilling to let go of what he had, he unwittingly revealed something about himself that 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 he he's actually breaking what commandment? The very first commandment. And the very first commandment says, You shall not have any other God beside me. That's why Jesus never brought it up because Jesus knew exactly what he was already struggling with. So Jesus lays out a challenge. How many of you know this? Please let's get some clarity for those of you who have a little bit of money. Jesus is not always going to ask you to give away all your money. 
Because if some of you give away your money, you're going to be broke. Don't your neighbor say, I think he's talking about me right now. The reality is that God lays different challenges before different people, and we need to get this. This was a specific challenge that was related to this specific young man because it was a specific place in his life that he was struggling with because possessions was his God, and Jesus knew it, and that's why Jesus confronted that. Now, we learn a, a quick three things. Write this in. This is just for foundation. And, and if you don't like the direction, it's just going to get worse here in a minute, okay? Watch this. We learn from the rich young ruler that, number one, it is easy to be self-deceived. Listen to what his response is. I have obeyed all the commandments, the young man replied. So in his mind, he is doing what he's supposed to be doing. The second thing is this. Possessions can be a blessing or a hindrance. Can I get an amen for that? Possessions can be a blessing or a hindrance. It all depends on how you perceive it and how you use it. Watch this. But when the young man heard this, he went away how? Sad. Why? For he had many possessions. Or another way to put it, many possessions had him. He couldn't let go of it. And the third principle is this. You either trust what you have or you trust God. Now, I want you to just quickly uh, just stay there in, in, that, in, in Matthew, and I just want to fast forward this quickly to 1 Timothy 6, and I want you to listen Paul's instruction to Timothy about those of us who have resources. Listen to what he says. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be what? Proud and not to do what? Trust in their money. That, that's the key, which is so un reliable. Their trust should be in God who richly give us all we need for our enjoyment. How many of you know God does not have problem that you enjoy what he gave you? Paul is just saying this. He said, you got to remind why. You got to remind. You, you got to remember that sometimes we look at people who have and we say, well, you know, why do they have and why? And we kind of judge them like that. I want you to know you, you work on your story. Don't worry about their story. All right. Watch this. Give us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich. Now watch this. In good works. So that means that God is not just interested in the money. He's interested in your heart. They must be rich in good works and generous to those in need. Always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they'll be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. Now, so Jesus is talking to this uh, rich young man, and he is explaining to him what he wants him to do. He lays down the gauntlet. He says, are you willing to do this? The young man realizes, wait a minute, this price is a little bit too big. I don't want to pay this price. And then he kind of walks away. Now, watch this. Then Jesus makes a statement that really shook the disciples to the core because we got to understand the context of what he's sharing. Look now with me in verse 23. Are you still tracking? Check this out. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth. Now, how many of you know when Jesus emphasizes that what he's about to say is the truth, you better be listening? Because Jesus is the truth, so the truth he's saying, I'm telling the truth, so you better be knowing what's going down. Watch this. I tell you the truth, it's very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, watch this. I'll say it again. Somebody say, say it again. So Jesus is not emphasizing only about the truth, that he's telling the truth. He says, I'm going to repeat this to you because I need you to get this. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Okay, so Jesus makes the statement. I'll explain that in a moment. And then in verse 25, I want you to notice the response. Somebody say, notice the response. Now watch this. The disciples were what? They were what? Astounded. They were amazed. And listen to the statement that they make. Then who in the world can be saved, they ask. Now Jesus emphasizes a very pertinent point in such a way that he repeats it for impact. And then he uses an hyperbole for effect. I mean, you're talking about emphasis, double emphasis, and then a triple explanation about the emphasis. I mean, he's really emphasizing this. Now, there are several different schools of thought on what Jesus was referring to when he was saying it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man uh, to go and have eternal life. The Persians expressed the concept of this impossible by saying it would be easier to put an elephant through the eye of a needle. The camel was a Jewish adaptation. That means the camel was the largest animal in Israel. That was the largest animal. So not, a, not an elephant, but a camel. 
So some theorize that the needle Jesus was speaking of was a, a needle gate. It was a, a low, narrow, after-hours entrance uh, uh, that you found in the wall of, of the, that surrounds Jerusalem. And it was purposely small for security reasons. And that a camel could only go through it by stripping it of all that it possessed or packed and crawl through on its knees. Now, the problem with this theory, and, and it's, it's a theory, uh, not necessarily a fact, is there's no evidence that such a gate ever existed. So the most likely explanation is that Jesus was using an exaggeration for effect, a figure of speech that exaggerates something for emphasis. Jesus uses this technique often throughout his teaching and, 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 and said, you know, the plank in your eye, the splinter in somebody else's eye, or, or swallowing a camel and, you know, uh, 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 um, straining out a gnat. So Jesus uses hyperbole throughout his speaking, and this is probably one of those. Now, Jesus' message is clear. It is impossible for anyone to be saved on his own merits. Since wealth was seen as a proof of God's approval, it was commonly taught by the rabbis that rich people were blessed by God and they were therefore the most likely candidates for heaven. Jesus destroys that notion and along with it the idea that anyone can earn eternal life by their money. They were utterly amazed and asked, well, who then can be saved? In the next verse, uh, if the wealthy among them, which included the super spiritual Pharisees and scribes, were unworthy of heaven, what hope was there for a poor man? So in their minds, when Jesus said, it is very difficult for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven, in their mind says, okay, if the rich can't enter into heaven, then there is no chance for us. We are never going to make it. Because the Pharisees taught that in order your, your richness was a sign of the favor of God. And the richer you were, the more likely you were going to land up in heaven. How many of you know that Jesus destroys that? Because that's why Jesus said, you've got to understand nobody, but nobody is going to make it to heaven based on their own merit. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. There's only one way that you have to go, and that is through me. Now notice how Matthew, as he's, as he's telling us the story, he spells out the tension here. G kind of live in the story because there's tension going on. Watch this. He wants us to see that Jesus was leading the conversation. You have to understand this, that Jesus did not haphazardly talk to them about stuff. There was a specific direction to broaden their understanding and to bring them some insight. Now watch this. Look at verse 26. Jesus, notice what it says. Jesus looked at them how? Now, how many of you ever looked at somebody intently? Would you, would you just turn to your neighbor and just look at them? I mean, just kind of, don't give them the evil eye, but just look at them. Some of you are just mean. But when you look at somebody intently, that means you're about to communicate to them that, hey, I want you to, I want you to listen to this. I want you to hear what I'm about to say. So Jesus looks at them intently. The, the tension is building, all right? And he said this, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but with God, what? Everything is possible. Folks, I need you to take the understanding of this, of this passage out of that Jesus saying money is bad, you know, and, and, and you know, poor is good. I want you to know neither poverty nor wealth has anything to do with salvation. And that's the message, that's the core message that Jesus is communicating here. It's neither the fact that you have money or neither the fact that you don't have money. That's not the issue. The issue is what you are going to do with Jesus. That's the issue here. Okay? And Jesus is saying that the only way for us to enter into what he has for us is to know that with us it is impossible, but with God all things are what? Possible, including your salvation. Salvation cannot be earned or bought. It is a free gift, and that gift can only come through God's intervention. But now amidst this conversation, watch this. Peter was listening, and something that Jesus said to the rich young man perked Peter's interest, and he asked a question that maybe some of us have asked. Now, how many of you know that sometimes when you have a conversation with somebody, they will pick out one thing in the whole thing that you were saying? And this is exactly what Peter is doing. Peter has listened to the conversation Jesus has with this rich young man, and he's only going to pick out one thing, all right? He only heard one thing. How many of you know that some, for me, this is very funny. Sometimes I preach, and then people tell me what I preach after service, but I never said those words. 
said, remember when you talked about this? And I'm like, mm, I know my notes. I actually write down my notes, and that never came up. Sometimes they confuse me, and I go back, and I listen to the seed. I'm like, no, I didn't say that. People give me credit for stuff I didn't say. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but that's why is it? Because it's whatever world they're in, whatever place they're in, that's what people are hearing. And that's why you've got to understand whether a message is positive or negative to you will determine about the perspective that you have on the inside of you, not about the words that somebody is speaking. So whether you receive a word or don't receive a word, that is completely determined on what's going on in your heart meditation and what's going on in your own thought life because you are going to perceive what's being said not according to what is actually being said, but according to the things you want to hear. And that's exactly what Peter is doing. Peter is going to make a statement or ask a question because he only heard one statement. Forget about the commandments. Forget about that the you know, rich guy didn't want to sacrifice and pay the price. He was only going to ask one question. Watch this. Are you ready? Because here's the question that, we, that some of us have asked, maybe not the spiritual ones, but some of us have and I have. And here's the question. If I do this stuff, if I give up my life, if I sacrifice everything, what's in it for me? Have you ever asked that? Now, if you don't believe it, watch, look at verse 27. Then Peter said to him, watch this, we've given up what? Everything to follow you. What are the next few words? He just heard Jesus promise this guy what? He promised him wealth in the afterlife. He promised him blessing in the afterlife. And then he promised him eternal life. And Pete, that's the only thing Peter heard of the conversation. And then Peter says, well, hold on a second. If, if you tell this guy he's going to get, what are we going to get? How many of you know we are great at singing that rap song, What's In It For Me, Right? We're great at doing it. Now, before we all get too self-righteous and jump on Peter, let's just be honest. We all wonder sometimes if it is worth it. And if you have not, you are either not honest about your heart's reflection or you truly have not considered the cost of following Jesus. Jesus is not a part-time Lord. He is not a God of convenience just when I need Him and the rest of the time I do what I do and I live how I want. But what is so beautiful about Jesus, about our Lord, is the fact that He does reward and He promises rewards. Now listen to me very closely. If, if you've checked out before now, don't check in right now. If you've been playing games on your phone, then get off of it and listen to what I'm going to say right now. Okay, check in. If you don't get anything else I say, you have got to download this right now. Slap your neighbor. Say, wake up, download this. Come on. Are you ready for this? It's a statement I want you to write down, but you have got to get this. You have to get this, and you have to have this as an underlying thing in your heart. There is a reward for everything you have relinquished for God's kingdom and purpose. I'm going to say it again. There is a reward for everything you have relinquished for God's kingdom and God's purpose. Now, when I make a statement like that, and we make statements like, like this, it, it's, it is kind of a, a really, kind of a shocking statement, but kind of a statement that some of us, well, you know, I don't really know, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not really in it for what's for me, but Jesus is okay with rewards, because throughout the Gospels, He tells them that they will be rewarded. Notice that He does not rebuke Peter and say, Peter, you vile demon, you. You know, how you're so selfish. You just think about yourself. He doesn't do that. But he's going to explain to Peter how his reward system works in his kingdom. How many of you understand that God's way of rewarding is not necessarily our way of rewarding? All right? You've got to get this. When we make statements like this, you cannot outgive God. How many have ever heard a statement like that? You cannot outgive God. Now, that's not just a good refrigerator magnet saying, hey, that's wonderful. It's very true. Why? It is rooted in this reality that you cannot outlove God, and if you cannot outlove Him, you cannot outgive Him, because what have we learned throughout the series? Love does what? Gives. So how can you, who only possess love, outlove love itself? For God is love. Now watch. Watch how Jesus responds to Peter. He does not rebuke him for wanting to be rewarded. He explains to him the rewards. Notice now in verse 28. Are you still there? 
Look at this. Pick this up real quick. Watch. Jesus replied, you dumb Peter, you just want stuff, don't you? Is that what he said? No. Watch this. Jesus replied, I assure you. Whoa. No. Hold on there. Hold the phone there. M uh, uh, Mabel, let's just talk about this. Jesus is not just saying, okay, let me tell you what. He says, I I'm, I'm assuring you. So again, Jesus using language that is a confident language. This is definitely going to happen. Watch this. I assure you that when the world is made new and the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne, you who have been my followers will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. How many of you think that's pretty cool? That's pretty amazing. You dudes... You're going to be ruling with me. That's what's going to happen when it's all said and done. Verse 29, and watch this. Because if he stopped there, that would have been great for them. But I would have asked, well, what about Henny? What about me? Now, what, look at verse 29. Watch this. And everyone, are you, are, are you and everyone? And everyone who has what? Given up. Somebody say given up. Watch this. Houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. Jesus making sure that you understand, and, and I understand this, that there is not a price that you will pay that there will not eventually be a reward for. There is not something that you can give up Maybe a relationship, because he talks about relationship. Maybe a thing, maybe a possession, maybe wealth, maybe money, whatever it is. He says, if you are willing to sacrifice for me and my kingdom, I guarantee you that what's waiting for you is way better than the stuff that you gave up. Now watch, and then he makes a statement. Listen to this in verse 30. But many, and he adds a but. How many of you know sometimes we like the buts, sometimes we don't like our buts, but this is not a good but. Watch this. But many who are the greatest when? Now will be the least important then. And those who seem least important when? Now will be the greatest when? Then. So he talks about the now when he talks about the then. So here's a thought I want to give you. Write this in your notes real quick. The reward is never in question. Our obedience is. The reward is never in question. Our obedience is. God is going to reward each and every one of us. That's not the question. The question is, are we obedient? Now hang with me because Jesus is not done with this concept of rewards because he explains to them what the kingdom of heaven is like. So sometimes in our Bible we read and say, okay, it's the next chapter, it's something else. No, 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 no. Jesus is still on the same topic. He's still talking about this. And he is not done explaining to them. He explains to them what the kingdom of heaven is like. And in Matthew 20, he begins to tell them the parable of the landowner who goes out and hires workers at different times for his vineyard. And he starts the story by saying, you know, he goes out early in the morning. And he hires a group of workers, and, and he agrees. He said, okay, boys, you're going to come work for me? They say, yes, we'll work for you. He said, okay, what, what do you want to be paid? They agree on the amount. They say, this is what we're going to be paid. He said, okay, now you get working. Then at 9 o'clock in the morning, he goes by again, uh, and, he, and he finds in the marketplace, there's some more people there. And he goes to them and says, hey, how come you guys are not working? I said, well, you guys want to work here? He said, okay, go ahead. You know, I, I need you. They agree, and they go and work. He does this several times. He does this at noon again. He does this at 3 o'clock again. And then at 5 o'clock, now there's only one hour left for work. 6 o'clock, they quit. So at 5 o'clock, he goes out again to the marketplace, uh, this, this landowner, and he finds that there are people who still have not been hired. And he says to them, hey, how come you guys are not working? And they say, well, nobody hired us. He said, okay, do you want a job? They say, yeah, we want a job. He said, okay, now what I want you to do, go into you know, my vineyard and go ahead and work. And uh, we'll, we'll settle afterwards. You know, we'll pay you what is fair. Now, this is very, very interesting because at the end of the workday, something happens that is related to the conversation that Jesus had with Peter. Now, watch this. Are, are you ready? This is what I call principles of rewards. But before we rewrite it in, I want you to go down to verse 8 of chapter 20. Watch this now. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them. Now, watch how he does it. Beginning with the last. Somebody say, beginning with the last. Okay, now, we know this guy or these guys only worked for how long? About an hour, right? Now, watch this. Beginning with the workers, the last workers first, when those hired at 5 o'clock were paid. Now, watch this. When they were paid, each received what? 
a full day's wage. Now, did they work a full day? No, but he paid them a full day. Now, watch. We, we've got to understand this. I want you to write this down. The first thing is we all work because the owner was kind enough to hire us. Meaning, say, what are you saying? We are all part of the kingdom because God in his grace brought us into the kingdom. Nothing to do with us, all to do with him. And we have this thing so twisted, especially those of us who have been around church for a long time, and those of us who think, well, you know, because I've been serving God so long, because I know about God so, so long, or even those that are in ministry, you know, that get paid through ministry, well, you know, I mean, I work so hard in ministry, surely there should be a bigger reward. Watch this. We think we are doing God a favor when, in fact, we are the recipients of His favor and grace. People get burned out because in their minds they think, look at all I have done for God when we conveniently forget that the only reason we are able to work in His vineyard is because He saved us by His grace. And the only reason any of any of these workers could work is because the landowner went out and hired them. Stop thinking that your giving and your generosity and your service is doing God a favor. It is just the opposite. The favor is being done for you, not because of you. How then can anyone be saved? For with God, all things are possible. We are the recipients of the favor of God, and God has blessed us, not because of us. Listen to me. There's nothing that you can give that he has not already given to you. We all work because the owner was kind enough. Number two, are you ready for the next one? Do the job that God has asked you to do. Do the job that God has asked you to do. Notice this. Look at verse 10. When those hired first came to get their pay. Now watch, watch this. They what? Say it loud. Now how many of you know, you know the word assume, what it makes of you, right? When you assume... Okay, you're the donkey and somebody else is the legume. I don't know, but that's, you know what, you know, I don't have to go there. You are very spiritual as far as that. They assumed that they would what? Receive more. But they too were paid what? A day's wage. When they received their pay, they what? Protested to the owner. I, I want to I put this as clear as you can understand. Don't make assumptions about your service to the Lord. Just simply do what God has asked you to do and leave the rest in His hands. Keep your eyes on your responsibility and be grateful for grace in your life. And watch out for a complaining spirit and attitude. Because it is the quickest way how you can lose your joy, but not only lose your joy, lose your reward. The, 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 one of the things I was speaking to the, to the uh, uh, um, um, woman rock on, on, when was it, Thursday? You know, on, on Rock Women, and uh, we, we just had a wonderful time. And one of the things that I communicated to them is this whole idea of how people lose out. And the reason they lose out is because they complain. How many of you, know, how many of you understand this, that God hates a complaining spirit? He doesn't dislike it, He hates it. As a matter of fact, the only reason the children of Israel never saw the promised land is because what? They murmured and complained about absolutely everything. And it had to do with what? Possessions. It had to do with provision. They, they complained that God could not take care of them, and He could. And we know He could. And even Moses did not enter into the promised land. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that Moses was strong enough. Moses, he, he was 120 years old, and his eyes was not even dim. That means he didn't even need reading glasses. I mean, that's how strong he was. He was able to climb mountains. And God says, listen, Moses, you can look. Why, 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 why could Moses not enter in? Because every time the people complained, Moses got angry. And he responded in anger to the people's murmuring and to the people's complaining. And then Moses complained to God about the people. And they could not enter the promised land. You do the job God has asked you to do. Watch this, number three. Uh, it's very quiet in this Presbyterian church, but it's okay. Are you ready for number three? This, say, this is muy importante. Okay, watch this. Don't compare yourself with others or covet their blessings. 
Don't compare yourself with others or cover their blessings. Look at verse 12. Listen now what these complaining work saying. Those people work only one hour, and yet you've paid them just as much as you paid us. Now listen to this. Listen to the attitude here. Who worked all day where? In the scorching heat. I mean, like, you, do you realize how tough we had it? Do you realize how difficult this was? Now watch verse 13. He answered one of them, friend. I love how he communicates. Friend. He didn't say, you scoundrel, get out of here. He says, friend. I haven't been unfair. Now watch this. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Now what's the answer to that? Yeah, of course they did. That was the agreement. They had the agreement. Now watch. I love this. Take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Human nature says this, I deserve more because I do more. God says, you don't have to worry about the rewards part. Don't look at what others have and compare yourself with them. Don't cover other people's blessings. Folks, Jesus makes it clear for the disciples. Is it not true that the longer some of us serve the Lord, the more deserving we think we are? Come on now, let's just be honest. You know, why do they, I mean, look at that guy. You know, I know he's not always obedient to God, and look at how God is always blessing him. You know, why are they blessed in the same way that I am when I've done more, worked more, worked harder, worked longer, faced more heat? When I don't get paid, do they get paid? What, you know, what's going on around here? None of you. I'm, not, I'm talking about staff meetings. I'm not talking about any of you. <laughs> Jesus is laying this down. He's going through the process. He's making sure that Peter's understanding. He's explaining to Peter, Peter, I've called you. You are in this Bible. Peter said, but you know, I've given up everything. I had a fishing business, man. I used to catch fish. I mean, I had, a, I had a good thing going. And, and, and Jesus said, don't you worry about that. You, you get rewarded. You get yours. You know, don't worry about the fact that I'm promising somebody else something just because of that. Don't worry about the blessing in other people's lives. Don't cover the blessing in other people's lives. Thank God there are people that are blessed. Because if everybody was poor and broke like you, we wouldn't be able to do anything. <laughs> Am I talking to the right people? No, don't get mad at me. The fact is sometimes we look at other people because they have, but we have no idea how much they sacrifice. We have no idea how much they give. We have no idea how much they contribute. We have no idea how many times they open up their home for things. We have no idea what they do for the kingdom of God. We only look at what they drive. We only look at the externals, and we don't realize that they are paying a price. And they might even be paying a higher price than you because they are trusting God, believing God, and they are working together for the kingdom of God. And just because God has blessed them and put resources in their hand, and you know why God does that for some? is because He can trust them with it. Oh, I'm not going to get a lot of hallelujahs today. But man, I'm laying down. Some lumber. I'm bringing it. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm not comparing myself to you. How much money do you make? No, don't. Don't do that. Are you ready for the next one? It's very simple. Number four. Here's what you got to get. So I got to get this. God determines the rewards. God determines the rewards. Look at verse 15. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? You whining, well, God, why aren't you giving this to me? God says, it's my stuff. Look all around you. All God has to remind you is how did you come onto this earth? Did you bring luggage with you when you came? When you were born, did you drive up? Did you have keys for a Ferrari? Did you? Did you have a bank account already set up? No, you didn't because you came naked. And when you die, when we put you in the ground and we pay our last respects, are you taking anything with you? Come on now, somebody. It's kind of the guy that was always so mean to his wife. And he, I mean, he's always just giving her grief. It says, when I die, you better make sure you put my money that I made in my coffin. I'm taking it with me. He even made a, he made a requirement. When he, when he dies, 
So his friends would come to say, well, you know, his funeral is today. What are you going to do? He says, don't worry. I'll show you what I'll do. He said, but, you know, are you going to put the money in his coffin like he said? She says, you know, I'm going to honor his last wishes. And uh, so as, the, as they were at the service, right towards the end, right before they closed the casket, she walked up and uh, she pulled out a check and she put a check in there. And she says, go ahead and cash that. <laughs> Good for her. How many of you understand? You, uh, you ain't taking it with you. It's not going with you. God determines the rewards. None of us are owners. We are simply workers, and we are fellow workers with others. Peter, I know you are looking at this rich young man, and you heard what I said, that he would receive a great reward in heaven if he chooses to follow me. And in your mind, you think, well, we were there from the beginning. What are we going to get? Jesus makes it clear that we understand a very important principle, and that is we own nothing. And the moment we act like an owner, we make assumptions about God's grace, and we move from grace to earnings. Well, I deserve this. The whole concept that Jesus is talking here is all about that. It's all about grace. Rich, poor, it's all about grace. He wants them to understand this. Folks, let me make this clear here today. The only thing we have earned, the only wages we are deserving of is the wages of sin, and that is death. We actually don't get what we deserve because of the master's goodness. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I'm kind to others? Do you forget the only reason you had a job is because I found you and hired you? Why do you suddenly act like you did me a favor? Don't be short-sighted. When you started, hear this now. is not as important as the fact that you started. And in starting, there is a reward. The master is always looking. And by hiring workers at different times during the day, he illustrates that. God is always looking for the lost. He's always looking for those who don't know. He always wants to bring them in. And we better stop this idea of it's them and us. Stop that thinking. We are all part of the human race that is in need of a Savior, that is in need of a God to step into our lives and save it. I think there's a reason that the owner had his foreman pay the last first. Some of you have been Christ followers so long you forgot what life was without Jesus. And instead of becoming more grateful, we suddenly feel we can make demands. Well, I, I've been around this thing, you know. I, I, stop that nonsense, I'm going to slap you. You see, you and I have a choice. We can look at what we are doing or look at what Jesus has done for us. And when we do, I believe we will not only see our service as a sacrifice, but we'll see it as a privilege. I cannot outgive him. I cannot outlove him. I cannot outserve him. And all I have is because he found me at the marketplace when nobody wanted me. And he gave me an opportunity to serve in his vineyard. And whatever awards I may receive, and however that compares to what others receive, I believe that he is just. I believe that he is gracious. I believe that he is more than enough. I am just thankful that I get the opportunity to be part of his kingdom. And whether I get paid one day's wage, two day's wages, that is irrelevant. It's his money. It's his reward. And he can hand them out however way he sees fit. Understanding that our lives need to be explained, not from a natural point of view, but from a supernatural point of view. I'm going to close with a story. Maybe, can we put up that picture? This is a picture of Willem Whiting Board, and maybe some of you have heard of him. He was born in a very prominent and wealthy Chicago family, and the third child of William and Mary DeGarmo, Whiting Borden. Borden's father had made a fortune uh, in the Colorado uh, silver mining and real estate in Chicago. By the age of 21, he was well worth more than a million dollars. That was in 1908, an equivalent in household purchasing power today of about 66 million, uh, or real wage earnings of about 28 million. And uh, with his own money, he did a lot of stuff. He funded New Haven Rescue Mission, and there he did personal work himself. He was brilliant. He was a great athlete. He was a very lovable person, likable person. 
Uh, one well-traveled English uh, visitor, when asked what, was mo- what he was most depressed about in America, said this, about, this is about him that he said this. The sight of that young millionaire kneeling with his arm around a bum in Yale Hope Mission. Uh, Borden's intention was to become a missionary, and, and literally he made it known to his parents that he was going to give up all his wealth. And as a matter of fact, he did. He gave all his wealth away, and then he gone on a ship, and uh, he traveled uh, uh, to uh, Egypt where he was going to study because he wanted to reach in an unreached uh, people's group in China. Uh, he wanted to reach them uh, for Christ, and uh, th- this was just incredible. So at the age of 25, he did this, but here's what happened. In March 1913, he contracted cerebral meningitis, and he died a few weeks later. He was 25. Now, ironically, his mother had just arrived from America to vacation with him in the mountains of Lebanon, and she was present for just a simple funeral in which uh, Samuel Zwemer participated. Borden is buried in the American cemetery in Cairo. If you go there, you'll find his grave. And on his grave, this is the inscription. This is words that were suggested by Charles uh, Erdman. He said this, Apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation of such a life. Apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation of such a life. And many people at first thought, because he was offered much more wealth, he was offered many more opportunities, but William Whitingborn was, was willing to lay that down, give it away, and follow the call of God on his life. And in following the call of God, he actually died. They said that he wrote three things in his Bible. This is not a proven fact, but this is, uh, this is what they say he did. The first thing he wrote was no reserve. The second thing he wrote was no retreats. And the third thing he wrote was no regrets. Let me ask you a question. What if we choose to live our lives in such a way that the only explanation that makes sense is because of our faith in Jesus Christ? Apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation of such a life. What part of your life can only be deemed as explainable because you follow Jesus? What actions are you taking in your life that the only reason it makes sense is because you're willing to follow Christ? Jesus finished in Matthew 20 with the same words that he finished in Matthew 19. So again, for emphasis, What are these words? Look at this. So those who are what? Last now will be first then. And those who are first will be... Sometimes we feel like we're losing. But that doesn't matter. Because in fact, we are winning because of His grace. We've won already. Because of his goodness. You have a decision to be made in your life. So what are you going to do with Jesus? Simple as that. You can't earn your way to heaven. It's not possible. It doesn't matter how rich you are, how poor you are. That's totally irrelevant. What's relevant is God's grace in your life. Let's bow our heads this morning. And I want to pray with you and for you. If you're here today and you're watching online, maybe you've never considered. Maybe you've never considered following Jesus. There's a lot of following Jesus that the church has made known that has got nothing to do with following Jesus. There's a lot of stuff we've put on people just like the Pharisees that Jesus never put on people. There's a lot of stuff we think of church that has nothing to do with church. There's a lot of things that we make things, major things about that are not major at all. The question is, how is your relationship with Jesus? That's the question. The question is, what are you going to do about him? When this rich young man came to him, he called him good. And Jesus makes this statement. He says, no one is good but God. Inferring that if you call me good, you know who I am. And if you know who I am, then you will do what I tell you to do. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He is the only way. There is no other way. 
There's not many roads that lead to God. Well, you know, I can just kind of, you know, we, we just need to be understanding that there's many ways to get to God. Not according to Jesus. According to Jesus, there's only one way, and that's through Him and Him alone. And in this room, collectively together, I want you to understand this. That sometimes as the church, we tell people all the good stuff that might happen. When you follow Jesus. Here's the reality. When you follow Jesus, He is calling you to lay down your life. He's not promising you riches. He's not promising you all the stuff that sometimes we do. He's asking you, are you willing to believe in me? And are you willing to sacrifice your life for me? Are you willing to give up all you are today for all I can make you tomorrow? Because he says, follow me and I will make you. And that's a process. And some of you are a little bit in, a little bit out, a little bit here, a little bit there. You can't live a double lifestyle. God doesn't have double agents. It's either Jesus or not. That means he's either Lord of all or not Lord at all. And that's what I'm challenging you to today. Follow him with all of your heart. No compromise. All in. No reserves. No retreats. No regrets. I'm in all the way. I'm in till the end. Until either I breathe my last breath on this planet or when He returns. But I'm in all the way. And I'm willing to lay down my life and pick up His. So that's truly your heart's desire. That's what salvation is. It's all about. It's dying so that you can live. If you haven't done that, then I'm going to ask and challenge you today to do that. If you're watching online, I'm going to challenge you to do that. If that's you, well, every head is bowed, every eye closed, and you say, Henny, I want to follow that Jesus. I want to lay down my life for Him. If that's you, I want to pray for you. Would you just pop your hand up right now and let me see it? Thank you. 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 You can put that down. I see them. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. I want to pray with you. There's no magic in this prayer. Those watching online can pray with us. I'm going to ask those of you who are following Jesus, to pray this with me. Let's pray this out loud as an encouragement to everybody praying this for the first time. Say this. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your forgiveness. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. I believe that you died for me on the cross and shed your blood so that I can be forgiven. And today, I lay down my life and I pick up yours. Help me to follow you all the days of my life that I may serve you, that I may know you, and one day forever be with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. If you believe that, give the Lord a clap offering that he is worthy of today.